always come prepared. You know what I'm saying? That's why I don't have a suit jacket on. Hope it didn't offend anybody today. Some people say, well, I'm stressed like that every Sunday. <clears throat> but when I put my suit jacket on, it all gets wet. Uh, can, can I give a praise to the Lord what something that just happened? Amen. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> let me tell you what happened yesterday. I bring the baptistry in, and I bring the hose from outside, and I fill it up. And then I go back and do the other stuff in the office, and then I go check it every once in a while. Yeah. <clears throat> One time, one time in history since I've been doing this, I have forgot about it, and it filled the floor, the carpet, and I had to take a, get one of these vacuum things and suck all the water out of it and just keep rubbing it. Anyway, yesterday, it's the closest I've ever came besides that. I was in the office, and I, I don't know, I was working on some stuff, and I'm like, it just hit me. I think maybe you ought to check on the baptistry. I literally came in, and it was as full to the top as you can get without spilling over. And I actually had just splashed over just a teeny bit, and I ran, and I grabbed that hose and <laughs> pulled out, <laughs> threw it out the door. But it could have been a mess. You might even had water under your feet this morning. So I said, Lord, I thank you for bringing that to my thoughts at the perfect time but no we do welcome you to new beginnings this morning and I really hope that you have uh, came today to receive something anybody want to receive anything from God today huh but it's it's more than that isn't it it's like we should come to give and no I'm not an average pastor asking for offering again no I'm talking about giving of yourself that you ought to, there ought to be something that you give to encourage other people and, and, and build, kind of build into the lives of others. And I hope that you have came for that reason. These are exciting days. It's, it's almost Resurrection Day celebration, right? You realize that is two weeks from today? Two weeks. So I hope that you will do a couple of things that we've been asking you to do. Number one, invite, invite, invite. Invite people to church. Number two, pray, pray, pray. Pray that God will do a wonderful work among us. Now, next Saturday is our Easter extravaganza. We're not at the park this year. It's, I know it's different, but uh, we are here and we'll sign up sheet right through that wall. And again, sign up. If you haven't signed up, you don't have to be a member. You don't have to. You can be brand new. Uh, so sign yourself up and sign your neighbor up. And then tell your neighbor, guess where you're going next Saturday. <laughs> but we do want to pray this morning. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for all that you've done for us. Most notable, the giving up of your son on the cross for the penalty of our sins. And Lord, there's so much more that you provide for us as you provide our daily bread. And even if you've done nothing for us, you are worthy of our praise because you're God. And today we bring before you our sick that need a physical touch and Lord, the lost who need a spiritual touch. And Lord, we pray for the many we meet as we meet together on this Saturday and, and on Easter Sunday, that you would do a special work among us. And Lord, today we ask that you would speak to us through your word, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. For you that come on a regular basis, you know we are doing something that I, I've never done in my ministry. Uh, and I know that you won't believe that I have been preaching for 48 years. I don't know, I told you, I don't know how a 50-some-year, 56-year-old man can be, I, I started young. Um, but I've been pastoring over 44 years, and I've never went through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And so we're doing that, not verse by verse necessarily, but we're going through the Bible. And now we are in the book of Numbers, chapter 25. 
And what I've been doing is I want to get, kind of give a summary of what's going on in Numbers 25. And then, again, it's not a history lesson, not just a history lesson. It is also truth that we can apply to our lives. And that's what's really important. And so I want to go over this chapter with you. And we find a story of the Israelites having immoral relationships with women of Moab. And it really goes deeper than that because these women of Moab are trying to seduce them into worshiping their gods. And we find that's what happened as well. The god Baal, the Moabite god Baal is who they begin to worship. And if you remember as we went on from these previous chapters that the Moabites tried to hire a prophet to come and curse the Israelites. Remember how that went. God said, I'm not going to allow that to happen. I rather am going to have this prophet bless the children of Israel. And, but Jewish tradition says this, that this prophet named Balaam got together with the king Balak and said, listen, I couldn't get God to approve this idea of cursing the Israelites, so here's what I'm going to do. We're going to get our women, our most beautiful women, and we're going to seduce the men of Israel. And at the end of that seduction, part of that seduction is a ceremony where we worship the god Baal. And that's exactly what happened in this particular chapter. And then we see that God was angry with the people because of this. And we see the judgment of God. We find that part of this judgment was that the leaders involved were killed and a plague started among the children of Israel. And it said it got to the point where there were 24,000 Israelites who died because of the judgment of God. What stopped the judgment from, of God from killing more people was there was someone from the priestly family who went into a tent and actually killed a Moabite woman and an Israelite man because they had the nerve to come into the camp after the judgment of God had started and did this. And God said, because of that, I will give you a covenant of peace for you and your family. Well, the chapter concludes uh, with God commanding uh, that the Israelites destroy the Midianites because of this great sin that they were committing against the Israelites. And so that kind of wraps up the story. And I want to get several truths out of that to you this morning, that again, that we can apply to our own lives. Do you know what the title of this sermon is? Sin is a real issue. Do you realize that sin was a real issue in this story? And do you realize that throughout the Bible, sin was still a real issue? Do you realize that today, sin is a real issue? So let's look at this real issue of sin. I'm going to get kind of heavy this morning. Do you mind that? I mean, I just... I think any time you preach the Bible as God's Word, it gets a little heavy sometimes, right? But look at this first point. Sin is a result of seduction. And, and we see this in this story. There was this plan. Listen, you women, you go and you seduce these Israelite men. And we find out that not only were they involved in sexual activity, but more importantly, into idol worship. And this plan that they had to get to the Israelites worked. Well, Numbers 25, 1 and 2. Let's look at the very beginning here. While Israel was staying at Chittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. Now, seduction didn't start here. You know where seduction started? Back at the Garden of Eden. We find that Satan seduced Eve in, by taking of the forbidden fruit. 
Look in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Listen, a lot of the seduction of Satan revolves around the question, the questioning of God's word. Did you see what, what was said here? Did God really say? In other words, did God really mean what he said? Well, Satan is still seducing people with this lie. Just look at our moral climate of today among followers of Jesus Christ. And look at the behavior that is accepted. Even though God is very plain in his word what is right and what is wrong. Listen, I could get into just this area of sexual sins. And if I started down that road, we might be here till sometime this afternoon. But I just want to mention one other, and I could mention a lot, but I could mention the sin of getting drunk. Listen, I'm, I'm, I know the Bible, I think, well enough that I don't think the Bible says that it's a sin to take a drink. But you all know, if you all know me well enough, you know that I have always said that it is the best policy. It's, it's the best policy not to do it. But the Bible's very plain about drunkenness. And yet, how many people who say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ go down that road? And this is why we need to know God's word and trust in it as the real truth source, the only real truth source. When, when you don't accept the Bible as the real truth source, the only real truth source, then confusion sets in. And then people begin to make their own doctrines and their own rules, and they begin to say, well, this is what it feels like for me. This is what I think, this is the way I think I need to live. And this is what I think God will allow me to do. Or this is what God says I can't do. Well, we find a prime example of seduction in the life of Joseph when the wife of Pharaoh's captain of the guard decided to seduce him. In Genesis 39, 12, she caught him by the cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. You know, one thing, it's wonderful to know that we have an example of someone who was willing to say no and was able to say no, who had the power to say no. The sad thing is that there are a lot of people who do not say no when temptations come and when seduction comes. Well, we are warned about this prime seducer of sin that he is still active in trying to get people to yield to sin. I mean, the same Satan that was back in the Garden of Eden, the same Satan that would be tempting Joseph, the same uh, Satan that's tempting through people throughout history is the same Satan that is tempting people today. Look what 1 Peter 5 says. Be alert. And of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Satan is no respecter of persons. Satan would, is after us all. Satan would like to seduce us into sinning against the God that we love. Well, the second point is this. We see that idolatry is competing with the worship of the true God. Idolatry is described as the worship of false gods or something other than the true God. That something can be someone or something that becomes more important to us than God. Where, did, where is God in your life? Is he priority number one? Look what happens here. The children of Israel were enticed 
to worship this false god called Baal. Numbers 25, 2 through 3. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these, these gods. So Israel yoked themselves with the Baal of Peor. That's the Peor is the place. The, the Baal is the God that they worshipped. And it says they decided that they were going to worship him. Well, they should have known better, shouldn't they? There was no excuse. Just think about back in Exodus chapter 20 when Moses went up onto the mountain to meet with God and God gave him what? The Ten Commandments. And he came down and he spoke those to the people again. And, and then their, their children, these are their children. And it was like part of the Jewish family tradition was that parents taught their children from the Word. And I want you to look with me in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. These first two commandments, the very first two, dealt with this idea of idolatry, the sin of idolatry. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, uh, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Do you know the writer of John? John's one of the apostles, one of the disciples of Jesus. He understood that idolatry is still a problem. And look what he says to the church. Dear children, keep yourselves from what? Keep yourselves from idols. And again, sometimes people say, and I've heard, I don't, I would never take a statue and put it in my house and, and bow down and worship that statue. No, but you might have something else that's impor more important in your life than God. Where's God in your life? Again, is he priority? Or do you have to go down pretty far to find him in your priority list? Well, the third point is this that we see. Sin comes with consequences. We see this here. We see this throughout Scripture. Look what he says in verses 3, the latter part of verse 3 through 5. And the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves with the Baal of Peor. Listen. I'm glad I don't live in the Old Testament. But God took sin seriously. He took it seriously. And, and things have not changed because God also today takes sin seriously. Look at Romans 6.23. Many of you could probably quote this. For the wages of sin is what? Is death. So, so what is the, the result of a life of sin, it is death, which is eternal life for separation from God and heaven for eternity. You know what the Bible calls this place? This place of total separation from God. The other place, is that what the Bible calls it? The place without so much leisure. It calls it hell, right? And do you realize that word is taboo in our society? I mean, when a preacher even mentions that word, people are like, oh, you can't do that. No, that's, that's, that's like those old-fashioned people. You know, that was back in the day, but today we're more, we're more gentle. But hell is scriptural. It is a place of reality. And people should not want to go there. Well, Paul says in one of his letters he wrote to the church that it's possible to be deceived in thinking that there are no consequences for sin. Uh, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, look at this. Do not be what? Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. I like what the Living Bible says here. More plainer, but look at this. 
Don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. A man will always reap just the kind of crop he sows. If he sows to please his own wrong desires, he will be planting seeds of evil and will surely reap a harvest of spiritual decay and death. Look at this fourth point. Some sin with no shame. Do you realize what happened here in this story? After God showed his displeasure, these men were doing these things with these Moabite women. They started leading their families into idol worship. And God's judgment came upon the children of Israel. And it says that the children of Israel were weeping because of this judgment. And right during this time, this one, he was a son of one of the leaders of Israel, came in with one of these Moabite women right into the camp and took her into the tent in front of the people that were weeping. He had no shame. Look in Numbers 25, 6. Then an Israelite man brought into the camp a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. You know, Paul speaks of such people in the New Testament in Romans 1. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They already know what's right and wrong, right? They not only continue to do these very things, but they approve of those who practice them. And again, things have not changed. People commit sin, are not ashamed of committing sin in public view. There was a time where people, if they were going to do certain things, they'd sneak around and do it. You know, and, and hope they didn't get caught. But there came a time where this didn't seem to matter. At least in American history and probably around the world. This country, most of you were not here, many of you were not here, some of you were here. But you remember in the 1960s, you probably read about the sexual revolution that happened in our country. And of course, uh, one of the primary examples of that was Woodstock in 1969. Do you know that uh, I, was not, I was not there, okay? <laughs> I wasn't even a teenager yet. But it happened. And I don't know if you've ever read about it. I don't know if you've seen anything about it. But people were totally unashamed to do sinful activities in public. You know, I have a, had a pastor friend that I um, met and, and several years ago. He's been, he's been gone now to be with the Lord. But this man went out to California in the early 1960s to start a church. And he decided, he said, I want to reach these people. So he went and he had a service in a public park. Set up a stage, had a guitar, and he sang, and he began to preach. And all of these young hippie, mainly hippies and so forth, came into his service. And, and uh, he said, you know, he said, I, I left that first service, and I went to my uh, room, and I just laid across the bed and cried. Now, there's two points I want to make to this story. One is he was crying because he said, right in the middle of church, sexual activity happening right out on the grounds, right, right during church service. People smoking pot and shooting up with heroin and things, LSD. And people were just getting drunk right, right during worship service. Now, what that shows is that people have no shame. But second of all, more importantly than, than that, he went back and he prayed and he said, Lord, I'm, I'm just, I can't plant this church. I'm, I'm, I can't do this. Look what's going on. And the Lord said to him, you prayed and you asked me to, be, you asked me to use you to reach these people and I bring them right to your doorstep and you're complaining. 
And God began to change the lives of those people. And transformation happened. But oh, the point is, I'm, for this sermon today, was that there is no public shame. You know, today, again, I told you it's going to get heavy. Today we have gay pride marches. Got getting quiet. We have drag queen shows. I saw the other day where a church actually had that happen right, and they invited that to happen right during their, their worship service. We have pornography at the push of a button. You know, it's now a multi-billion dollar industry that is equivalent to bottled water. Total number of money made on bottled water is the same amount made in pornography. And people who, I'm going to stop with this. I got one more, and then we're going to move on. I think it'll get too heavy. But recently we had a St. Patrick's Day celebration in Savannah. Do you know there would be people who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, who would go hopping from bar to bar to bar and would get wasted. And they would do it in public. I'm telling you, things have not changed. Well, the fifth point is this. Sin needs rooted out at the core. Readers of this passage sometimes think that this is cruel as to what God commands. Look in verses 17 to 18. Treat the Midianites as enemies and kill them. They treated you as enemies when they deceived you. In the pure incident involving their sister Cosby, the daughter of the Midianite leader, the woman who was killed when the plague came as a result of that incident. God is saying, listen, this was a planned event. This was intentional. Their goal was to take you out. Their goal was to get you to go and worship other gods other than the true God. And he's saying, we've got to cut it out at the core. You know, some of you, I, I know, I mentioned a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I had a, a little a Band-Aid across my nose, some kind of, and remember what I told you all. I told you that I was getting a nose ring. And I don't know how many believed that. I don't know if anybody believed that. But by the way, for you, <laughs> I'm not getting a nose ring. But I had a lump come on my side of my nose there, and they had to cut it out and send it off, and they now... After Easter, I begged them to wait till after Easter. Uh, I am going to have to be the knife going at it again because it is cancer. And they are saying they've got to go in and they've got to cut it all out and make sure they get it all. Why would they do that? Because if they don't, then it spreads. And the same thing happens here, happened in this story is God is saying, if I don't cut it off at the core, if I don't get down to the very root of it, then they're going to continually deceive you and continually attempt you to worship their God, Baal. And you know, the same thing for us today, isn't it? The same thing for us today. If we do not deal with sin, sin has the capability to destroy you. Colossians 3, 5 Look what Paul says. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So, so how do we put to death sin in our lives? Number one, you have to recognize it and admit it. Think about that. Isn't that the first step to any problem? Recognize it and admit it. Second of all, trust in the freedom that you've been promised through Christ. Look in Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's some offer to Christians. Third, 
Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. I would say this is the greatest need of the church. And to keep filling you. Every day you ought to be praying, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Stay away from areas of temptation is the next one. I mean, don't feed the sin. Some people say, well, this is my weakness. And then they go to those places. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Develop daily habits is the fifth one. That's prayer and the word. When you get in time with God, you become more like the people you hang around, right? And then establish accountability. Establish accountability. Have someone, if you're struggling with something, say, listen, I'm going to let somebody into my life, and I'm going to start sharing with them, and then I'm going to be held accountable. Well, the last point is there is a remedy for sin. Aren't you thankful? There was a remedy for sin. We find in this story that sin was answered by what? By God's judgment. Phineas, a member of the priestly family in an act of zeal, stopped the further judgment of God. And he further made peace between God and his people. And as a result, God promised him a covenant of peace. Look with me in verse 12. Therefore, tell him I am making my covenant of peace with him. This meant that his family, not only himself, but his family moving forward, would be able to be in that position as a priest. That was God's remedy for sin where he was offering up prayers and sacrifices for the people. Well, listen, even though we are all guilty of sin, we have this promise that there's a remedy. We have this promise that Christ Jesus will forgive us if we put our trust in him. Look in Romans 3. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. And he talks about this in other places. There is no difference. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. There is grace available to you. There is a remedy for your sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us needs salvation. Every one of us need need that remedy. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Do you remember that verse that we mentioned early in Romans 6.23? The wages of sin is death. I'm glad the verse didn't stop there. It goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In closing, the most important thing I could really say to you is that there's a remedy for sin and maybe it comes in the form of a question have you really accepted Jesus in your life as a remedy you ever heard of God's simple plan of salvation you ever heard that statement it's kind of simple isn't it it's simple that what you have to do is accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior to open up your heart and say, Lord, I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. And I need you to come into my life. Well, let's stand as we, I want to say a prayer and then we'll be singing our last song. And I'm going to be up front if you want to come and accept Jesus today or there's something else in your life you need to pray about, you can come to me. Or if you just want to pray on your own, you can come to the front here and just pray on your own. But let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Again, it is so full of truth. And Lord, we know that our world is full of sin. We know that every one of us has been born in sin. But we're so thankful that you provided a remedy. You provided a way so that we not only could have peace in our heart, but Lord, we would be promised this wonderful gift of eternal life. So Lord, you know the needs of each one here this morning. And we pray that you would help us to be faithful to what you're asking us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.